showing. And uh, one person who is unfortunately having a good time in the hotel uh, because of the situation with him, he is not going to play today. So we have three different uh, Beethoven sonatas. That's the prerogative of being an executive director. I can choose a program. The others discuss what they want to teach and then they come back to me. Uh, since there were a lot of Beethoven sonatas, I gave it to them. I mean, the guest artists. But I wanted to see if we can survive with three Beethoven sonatas from three different periods. And so, having said that, um, who's going first? Yes? Are you okay with the first movement to start off? Yes, first, first movement. Yeah, thank you. Okay.
a chance to get up there. Excellent performance. In so many ways, it's excellent that uh, I was, I always have certain things to correct constantly in some Beethoven sonatas, and you seem to understand many of the problems, and you conquered it, which is very, very good. Uh, the first first thing we should talk about uh, uh, in the, well, let's see, it's getting there, there you go, is, of, of course, these sonatas were written when Beethoven ba went back to Vienna uh, his second time and found out that Mozart died, and, and he found out that, well, the next best thing is to go to Haydn, I suppose, and took it to him, the three sonatas, which were dedicated to him. And one of these days, if you have a chance, in the footstep of Beethoven, that house is still there, next to St. Michael's Church, where Haydn lived on the fifth or sixth floor. And I've done it, and so should you. You go in and you trot up the stairs, and taking your portfolio, you show the master, and the master was horrified that somebody could write this way for the piano. First of all, it's in F minor, the first one, of course, opus two, number one. And people don't write in F minor. And that, that is reserved for development section and very dark moments. But to have a, you know, somewhere <laughs> Incorporating in that the real classical thematic material, because this is what we call the Mannheim rocket, mm -hmm. uh, as you probably know from your history. Uh, but incorporating that into F minor was something unheard of before, so the new and the old together. And uh, Haydn was horrified at the thought of Beethoven writing for the piano this way. You know, the, the <laughs> it, it, you know, People don't, don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and so he told Beethoven to revise his thoughts and get rid of these things and, and come back later on. And so Beethoven, who was totally convinced that he was right, went to the first, just around the corner, to a publisher and published it, mm -hmm. which was a huge step uh, or investment on his, on his part, primarily because he didn't have any money. Uh, so, it is, it, is a, it is a story that one has to say for the simple reason is that one has to play it convincingly like Beethoven was convinced, this is it, this is the future, this has to be done. We as performers have a job of not only living the music in our present day, but also going back. Uh, to the time when Beethoven was writing it, or thinking about it, or performing it, in many cases. And so, um, we, are, we, are, we are sort of a mixture, we, you, are, you as a performer. You, have, you can't possibly expect you to play it like Beethoven did, but at the same time you have to be infused, you have to sort of think what, what, what went through his mind. Uh, the next thing is that, that I think it's very, very important to understand, Beethoven, like, I don't mean to be rude to the young people, you talk a lot on the phone or you text an awful lot. And Beethoven was like that. If you look at how Beethoven goes from writing an awful lot of scales and arpeggios and everything all over the place, that has, goes from, it's much like improvising all over the place, to the conciseness of the 110 we're going to do later. It's, it's a world apart. And when you grow old, you say only a few things. When you're young, you talk all, all, all the time. And so this is Beethoven when he is young and exuberant. 
and especially in C major, and especially with con brio, you're getting there, but it has to sound even more excited and even more telling that you are so excited to be playing. And don't forget, Beethoven was showing off. He was showing off his capacity as a pianist in order to survive, mm -hmm. because people sort of started to talk about this huge-haired guy who's going around playing unknown things. And so all the palaces uh, wanted to have him. And this was, this was a selling point. He had to survive. He had, he had to have food on the table. Mm -hmm. So let's go into the actual music itself. The interesting thing about it is many of his first or earlier sonatas are including this. It's more like a string quartet, especially this is a string quartet. The four voices. Yes? So you, the first eight measures, or no, no, sorry, measure three, four, six, eight, ten, twelve measures are really string quartet playing. Mm -hmm. And so you have to imagine how will that sound. And not only that, but it's very difficult what he's asking us to do on our modern piano. On his piano, it wasn't that difficult to go. And then. But on our piano, that's very difficult, as you probably have work very hard on that. Yes? Yeah. So, and be careful, no. They're all, have you ever played with a string quartet? No. No, it's okay, you will. Uh, they practice an awful lot, the bow length. Pom, pom, how much do you do that in order to unify? So it's not just pom, pom, they measure it, as you, the string quartet would do very carefully, the length of the notes. Yes, and we are pianists, unfortunately, we tend to focus most of our attention on how to play the note, but we rarely focus on how to leave the note. We just leave it. But it, it, you have to take care of what happens after you play the note. Yes, it's just as, uh, just as important in many ways, because it, th it can destroy the note if you are not careful. So can you try the first, first two measures, which are the most difficult in the sonata in many ways? I want to hear... It's very difficult, but it's possible. No, you're moving into it. Legato. Yes. Okay. And, and this is very important because, again, Mozart also writes a slur or legato marking for four sixteenth notes. Never find. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, you can, you can try to find it, but it won't happen. It was, it was a, 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 something they did all the time. But as soon as you play five, because that's one, one, two, three, four, five. That's totally wrong. You can't do that. Yeah. And so, and, you know, again, what, what we are looking for is not, not altogether just authenticity, but that's how it is. The language of the classical period demands that. So, and even so, this next note is not legato. You, you look at it. This, this, then four notes, and then separate the... That's how it's written. It should be like that. Now you have to do this legato. And that's it. Of course, you don't have to lift your hand up, but don't, don't make it legato. Because if you do this, in actual fact, you, you are then doing something again, which is against so-called the classicism, you're accenting the third beat. You say one, two, three, four, one. It's not one, two, three, four, one. Very good. But your technique can do better. 
because you're making you're making a little crescendo. No. Good. Bravo. Three, four. Four notes are, are slurred, not five. If you do, everybody smiles and says, well, he's not such a good pianist after all. But you are. You know, da 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 measures, whole session, because we have at this moment, so you have a, a cello coming in, it's not legato, it's not written legato, is it? No, and the other thing is, then you have a sforzato, is it everybody playing staccato? Sforzato, I have a feeling that it's more like this. So it's not loud, it's just a sorry, this is legato. It's like a question. And you answer it. So again, classical style, in, in Mozart and Haydn, demand a kind of a question that is answered by a resolution. And this question, or this drive towards the cadence, is one of the most important elements uh, later on in concerto playing, when the, this moment becomes extended, and more extended, and more extended, so that the final resolution is delayed. Here, Beethoven just simply doesn't do that. It's too early in his life. Later on, he does. And so we have to subject ourselves to some sort of analysis to understand what happens here. And answer it. And he puts an accent. Now, Sforzato. Is, is a very delicate thing to, or not delicate, it, it's an understanding. What does sforzato mean? Stronger. Stronger, yes. But how strong? <laughs> you, can't, you can't really tell me because there's no measuring cup here. But you are playing within piano a sforzato. What you were doing before was something like in the middle of this heat wave that we are having, you, go, you throw a snowball at me. It's, it's so out of the question that you should go. It's far too loud. It's only calling attention to a certain C at that moment, and it draws attention that the melody has gone into the left, uh, into the cello. It's very, very simply done, but if you over accent it, it's wrong. Sforzato's in Beethoven's uh, mind was also very important, as we come later on, a type of delay. Now, some of the ma uh, master classes were talking about that, uh, delaying to understanding uh, what Sforzato's or accents mean. Not necessarily just a stra straight down accent. We have to sort of think. Can you go from the fifth measure to G? So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you uh, to be a little bit more string players. I take a little time. Can you measure? 
Palm. I can imagine the string quartet pulling themselves together and going palm, palm, That that sort of movement is in my mind to create that sfortato. Sfortato is not only the note itself; it's the space around it. And then you will, if you understand that, you can gauge. You understand the word gauge? You can understand how much to do the sfortato. Maybe you want a little more, a little less. It's, it's totally personal, but you don't want to drive it into a uh, moment when it's too much. Yes? Once again from G. Cello is also. I would be surprised. Gosh, he's doing a short title, so the pom, pa, da, 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 pom, pa. I would delay my answer to it. Da, 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 da. I would delay that. Delay is only minuscule. It's the artistic liberty that you have. At this moment, we are introducing. We are. We don't know where we're going. We just. Have, as the, I don't think this. This is thematic material that you can whistle to go home. Do you? It's not really a thematic material on the same length as, as, as a Mozart. That's beautiful. I can whistle that. I can sing that. This, practical, wonderful, it's, it's, it is everything, but it is not a melodic line on the same length. It is much more rhythmical than anything else, which Beethoven is famous for. So once again, so we are still piano, and then a full orchestra comes in. Beethoven, suddenly he appears the, here I am. And it's undeniably Beethoven. But if you go, it sounds like arpeggios. It sounds like, for God's sake, go home. I'm not paying five dollars for you to play arpeggios. Yes? You have to convince me that this was meant to be that he toyed with the idea of he's holding that. Surprise is the greatest gift composers have for us. It wakes everybody up. And not only that, it makes interest. And here is, for the first time, we can say the combrio kicks in. Yes? And you have the technique for it. So it's, it's not accent. He wants a large line with full of notes. And the full notes, and this is very interesting because even when we do the later on, the comprio means what? With brilliance. Yeah, no, no question about it. But allegro is still allegro. So the tempo is allegro but with a lot of brilliant playing inside it. So it's very, very easy to make it fast. It's not necessarily fast. It means full of life. So if you play every note becomes important, like you can imagine the strings play it. Or you can play it. See, I just played it faster, but not every note was alive. Then it's not combrio. Yes, you see? So your tempo is fine, but I, d I don't find in your playing every note live, every note. He wouldn't write a note without being meaning it. Try it. Yeah, can you go about two measures before? Students say, if I do exactly what's written there, 
Everybody will say, it sounds like, I sound like him and her and him and her. Where is the personality in this? The personality is timing. So for instance, when you get this, there, there's expectancy. Now, your expectancy is an immediate, immediate gratification, what we've been doing. But what would happen if you went like this? A slight break that gives that sfortato, for double forte, an impact on, on the music, impact that of the surprise. That is personal. Uh, you can delay it a little. Your way of doing it doesn't surprise me. It sounds like a fulfillment immediately. But it's something you can think about. Yeah. Too much is too much, too little is too little. Somewhere between yourself will speak out. All right? Can you? Let's go from here. <laughs> because they have nothing to say. There is a reason for it. And I think that the first time you go the second time he goes into a something different in the left hand, yes? Yeah. So the second time I really bring out the left hand a little more. Yes, the first time not so much. Yeah, I just change the color a tiny bit. Then it becomes more interesting, more fuller. And, and I think this is something that's very important for us to understand, that composers give us this wonderful um, tool to make it our own. And we don't use it if we just simply repeat it. And, and uh, then here... <laughs> Why all of a sudden? It sounds pretty. Beethoven is never pretty. Beethoven is full of energy. And he doesn't put any piano there. It's difficult. I'm not saying it's not. Well, because this is easy to do. Double forte. But and the, the double third, even more difficult. But he, here is one of the points, again, in classical uh, understanding of style, you never accent the th fourth beat. It's not. It, it will go to the first beat. And if you ever have a wonderful chance, which I had, of conducting and playing a Mozart concerto, the whole orchestra waits for the fourth beat more than anything else. Because the fourth is one. Four one, four one, not four one. That will never work. So don't don't hesitate. Go to that. Try. Bravo. But you have too much of a good technique because this. It has to sound. It's not. Every note. It's not, it's not, you know. That's too easy. It should be. It should be very carefully organized in your mind. So, but all of that is an outbreak of, of uh, if you look at it carefully, is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 measures against 12 measures of piano in balance. Balance is very important for classicism. So he balances the 12 measures of piano preparation with the 12, with 14 measures of real, um, not only double forte, but real, uh, how can I say, tension. Now, this is something which I'm very keen about talking about tension because. Tension is, is something that uh, has to be worked on. Uh, like, like what you did was very... 
when you did. You lost me. There was no attention in that. You, you dropped down. Now, the idea is fine if you can keep the tension. But if you lose me and lose the tension in me, which has been built up for the past five or six measures, then it destroys the whole concept of aliveness. And Beethoven is very keen about this sort of thing already at this stage, which develops in his third symphony and later on in his fifth and the ninth, when he has a whole section of double quartets, relentlessly. So he's, he's, he's already orchestrating himself, although he was writing piano because he, he needed to make a living. Mm -hmm. Yes? All right, uh, so we are in the dominant. Now comes the second subject, if you can. <laughs> eventually get to the major. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, the minor of, of Mozart is in everybody's mind. And Mo Mozart was famous for the G minor symphony. So you have to somehow get that, that feeling of that sound. That, that, uh, because it goes to D minor next, and D minor is, you know, the D minor concerto. So you really need the drama of the second and the beauty of the first, or pleading of the first. Different colors. See if you can, see if you can. to draw out of the piano a certain sound that makes us feel a little bit a little bit a a sad perhaps <laughs> one slur and another one and another one because these are strings playing yeah. or in the imitation now you, you might say why does Mozart Haydn and Beethoven have such a strong affinity to strings it's, it's, it's historical again you have to understand that's part of your learning uh, curve of understanding how to play this the violin already developed to its full potential. And the book written by Leopold Mozart, Mozart's father, is still in print in many countries because it is the way to play the violin. So it reached the zenith, the top of the violin school. But piano was new. It was like a computer with, you know, in the 50s. It was so new that they did not know how to write for the piano. They were exploring. So there were many sections of piano playing that became piano, and many looking back, how the, this, is, this is pure violin sound. Yes? And bow. These are bow marks. These are not. It, That's pianistic, that will come later on. But at this moment, it's really, you have to imitate, perhaps, if nothing else, the violin, or, or perhaps even the flute, I don't mind, but it, it, this is how they did it, uh, how they wrote. Once again, the...
considerably more dangerous. Yes, it's Don Giovanni. Yes, imagine it. I'm not asking you to play it very loud or soft or anything. Imagination, that you want to put something stronger here that is different to the this. This. you want to hear the sound of the orchestra eventually. same to me. First you have that So first it's an A minor feeling, followed by G minor feeling, and then suddenly D major. So what is he doing actually? He's getting back to the dominant. It's very simple to understand, but he got lost. He tried to do it in G minor, which Haydn objected to, and it was Beethoven, went into and but he's trying to get back. But A minor is different from G minor. This is a, I touch it differently. Certainly when I had a, a little bit deeper, that more more grayish sound. Yes? Gray or darker sound. But then the surprise is I'm very happy. I'm back home. I know where I am. You know. So there are three different ways of playing it. The minor and then and then and in this small little thing can make an awful lot of difference in, in, in the structure, how you build up the structure, because you're building a structure here, not only playing notes. Mm -hmm. you, without you understanding the structure of it, the piece falls apart, because this is music structure that is only surviving in your hands and in your head. And once it's gone, it's gone. It's not like a building. Yeah? So in, can you try to do it to the minor? <laughs> Bravo. I think that you're going to manage, you practice it and you imagine it. Again, the violin. The next one is not connected. Here's the question. See how easy it becomes more natural and more easier to understand why he does that. Try. But I can imagine when somebody does because you're really only playing this. You only bring out the top note. But Beethoven writes to you and it's a repeat. So I'm not asking you to play it loud, but the intervallic relationships change. This is close. And then I'm heading towards that. If I only do this, it's not so satisfying as a melody. Try. that has to be not 
only the first part of it, it's two measure phrase, it has to be clearly defined. following the right hand. But when I knew a left hand played, all of a sudden the right hand became super and says, get out of my way. You have to let the left hand do what the right hand did before. The le left hand is the one that is the leader in that, that passage. Can you do that again? you put there, that would just sort of feel, has the feeling of being dragging. You need to do that. You need to move. constantly, Beethoven wrote in his conversation book that when he has a series of sforzatos, he wants it always the crescendoing the sforzatos. So I will do the first one, and arrive. So this, each time more. If you do everything the first time loud, it doesn't work. You have to play loud, but give it Give it enough chance to go. If you what you did was I'm mixing up what was left behind. Acoustically, it takes a second more to get rid of the sound, and nobody's in a hurry when you go. Does it disturb you the way? Not really. It's a necessity in our concert hall. Yeah, try it and listen. You listen how long it takes. Yes. There's a difference between piano and double piano. Three. Until there, and 
then it becomes dum, dum, that's the second and fourth beat don't accent it you didn't do it before you shouldn't the trill is the one two, a surprise, a huge surprise, but you don't surprise me if you go to the medium. But then uh, the other thing is, you play so well, the chords are... And then comes a huge surprise. Why? Romanticism, but we've been, all the time, we were doing flats, B flat, yes? And F minor. And suddenly he puts all sharps, a C sharp ma major chord. If that doesn't surprise you, because that's the that's the reason why he goes to D major soon. When and I pointed this out several times to others to, in some private lessons. When you have lots of flats and all of a sudden there's a sharp written, that's a signal by the composer that the change of color must be done. Not weak, not necessarily weak, but it has to have a certain quality about it because this is a. See, he goes to D major. And that in itself is amazing because he starts in B flat, which is a half a step below C, and he lands half a step above C. So he, he kind of evolves the C major whole idea, uh, one low, one higher. So you really need to think about F minor and then this is yes and the maybe yes and then think about it. Those chords are not just there for uh, other reasons for you to show off that you are capable of playing it. I leave it to you because we need to get on. But do do the C, uh, D major. All, right. All this section is fantastic, very good, especially how you do this. You, you kind of need to make sure that this is an accent. This is not an accent. Consistently, he does. So there's one more difficulty here because he does this, but here he is definitely wants us to think that he wants the fourth and the second beat to be accentless. That's why he didn't do it before. So here, what, what you're not doing that. Do 
not maybe not that loud, but, but it's a double chord. Yeah. The difficulty is how to make this sound so loud, and this can't be. It's still double chord. Try. No, it it, it, it cannot be an upbeat. It should be. a cadenza, which is not a big deal because Mozart already wrote in his sonata some cadenzas. This is very good. I like very much. But do you, how do you solve this problem? The difficulty, I said it's a problem because so loud and yet the left hand is accenting against it yes and therefore
that's very good. Your sound is fine, but I can't imagine string players playing jump, chomp. It should be. <laughs> to me, that's more Beethoven. This. I know that you play the piano well, but it is one unit going down, so it's not separate notes. Okay, shall we go on to the next person? Oh, yes, please go on stage if you don't mind. Yes, thank you. That's all right, I will add a sonata. The Chinese I don't understand, but the music I do. Thank you. Pull it down, and then we can push it. Pull it down. Yeah. No, nothing. Just pull it down. Enough. Yes. Now you can push it down.
wonderful thing, very high level. Very high level, Joe. Good playing, very spirited, and in the spirit of what we expect from a conbrio. So from that point of view, I, I really enjoyed it. There are several problems with, uh, that you are facing that I find we have to sort of uh, think about. When you go... Those 16 notes have to be the same as this. Suddenly you took off. You took off to a different level, which kind of made me feel that you either over-practice those passages, they're not that difficult, but you either practice them, or you don't find Beethoven's uh, message of how difficult it is. If we would have to wash our dirty socks here in front of everybody else, that's, that's much, much more difficult to practice than this, you understand? But that's still 16th note, the same way as you do, which you did so beautifully. So the 16th note, while it's here, it's a unifying aspect to the whole sonata that you take sometimes very seriously and sometimes as if it, it just a lot of notes. But there's no such thing as a note written by Beethoven that is unimportant. Yes, there are levels of importance, but unimportant is no such thing. I think that one has to play, try very hard at the beginning. There are two things that happen at the very beginning, and that is, you have a tendency to play it in a small, small tone. One. You do that. So it's divided. I have a feeling that is So it's one unit in my mind. Yeah? You want to try that because it's a, it's a matter of, of um, uh, sort of feeling it much more than just uh, because there are rests there, so I'm not uh, sort of disputing that. Good. Now, when you're playing like that, you, I don't know if you realize it, but your left hand is different articulation to the right hand. The length of it. You go. Because you lift your heads up in your left hand, as a result you are drawn upwards, whereas the right hand is drawn downwards. I think if you really, sorry, uh, if you really make an effort to have unified not it will sound better. But why do, you, why do you need to have your fingers like that? Yes. Now, you, you will say, what's, what's the difference? Come on, you are too petty, meaning me. But in reality, if you do this, and you, if you do that, you're actually tightening a lot of muscles here by lifting those three fingers. By lifting those three fingers, the, the tightening of muscles tightens the hand, and the sound is different. That's why when you have octaves, a lot of people play. It should be really. As soon as you lift it up, it changes the color, if that's what you want. But in this case, distinctly when you went down. It changed. It changed because you lifted your hands up. And it's a bad habit. 
But if that's if 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 it doesn't disturb you, I, there's no way I'm going to change it, or if you're not listening enough for it, because you must admit this is a unified sound, and that's what we need more than anything else: the unification of the sound as it it moves. that becomes an extremely important structural thing later on when he goes this part here. When he goes into the second and fourth beat. Here, for the first time, the second beat becomes very important to him. Yes? But you destroy that, unfortunately, because you're going up. You're doing this. And you destroy it because the, he's, he wants us to remember more than anything else. He wants us to remember the second beat because he will come back to it many, many times throughout the whole sonata. Yeah, he goes back. Yes? Did you try it? And when you play it, again, this is very petty to many people, but to me, if you listen to great pianists, then they go, they head towards a resolution. This is, now we, you understand, it goes twice and then it moves, it moves to a resolution. That resolution doesn't sound good if I go, So what I try to do is ma make the first one a little bit closer to the key, more, and yeah, da, 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 da. Again, the touch is very important because you're repeating, repeating the same thing, and no such thing as repetition. He wants it to get more and more and more excited, so in order to resolve it. Yes? Have you ever seen Beethoven's handwriting? Sorry? Well, you should look for it, because he's, very, he's a very interesting person to get to know he's through his or, or the autographs. He gets very excited towards the cadence points. And he, and, and, and he scribbles. He just wants to get there. His mind is already on the resolution. And so probably with this, he just put two dots and just repeat. He wants to get that. You want to try that the, from the last one? It's up to you. Wait, Ian. Yes, it's all right. Yeah. Yes, you're thinking about the next part, but the best way a conductor would do at that moment for the pause is to think about it. So that when you are it took you a fraction of a second to get into it. You can't. You have to do it from the very first moment. Yes? Go from the... But 
I had to do it. Yes? Yeah. And, and I know that it's, uh, uh, it, it's a question whether you can discover the beauty of it. You know, sorry. The, the beauty of it, there's so many curvatures here. Instead of, there's chromatic scales, there is a, especially here. And again, the repeated. You see, I changed my touch the second time. The first time a little bit. I want to be a little more serious. And the important thing is, this is very, very, to me, uh, what, what can we do to make it more interesting? Not only the intervallic relationship of each note, as it happens to be so important, the Beethoven, the minor third. Those chromatic scales, those are very important. And when you hear chromaticism in classical style, it is dramatic, it is personal. It is not to be just uh, pushed aside. But the important thing is that there is, it's not legato, and, but we need to somehow feel the pulse. Without pulse, th there's nothing. One of our famous, uh, favorite moment here was when Leon Fleischer, standing there, and uh, was, uh, was asked, what is the most important thing in music? And he said, when he recorded all the Beethoven concertos with George Sell, and uh, he, was, he was a young man, he said, and he was, he was uh, absolutely in awe by this great conductor and with his great performances, and he'd asked the same question, what would you say is the most important? So this came from George Sell, and he said, well, actually, three things. Pulse, 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 and everything else is okay. So me, I can feel that here, if I would be a conductor, I would go, I would do two beats, one, two, but here, I would change the, the, my hand, I would go one, two, one, two, three, four, one, and then here, Beethoven does it for us. It's one, 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 two, three, four, you can hear it, but just, that's not the only place where you have to feel it. You have to feel it when he doesn't show it. And then it becomes interesting. It becomes more interesting and more dramatic, more Beethoven. It's not a simple uh, solution of just playing it. Uh, explore it. Um, and it comes from, again, violins. The violins, how many notes can they play in one bow? Is it eight or six or 16? It, it, it depends on how, how you divide it. Okay, once more if you can. Not too fast. I think we, are, we, we, we established that. accenting every every time you come in it sounds you know just accented it should be one line going through 
Can you go up on that? properly as Beethoven said. It's real legato. You're doing this. And you're trying to cover it with your pedal. Pedal is only good for certain things, but it's not to cover your sins. Yes, it's legato. sound woodwind uh, as opposed to strings in our hands, in our mind. What do you think? Um, the woodwind is probably more hollow than the strings. Are hollow, the strings. yes. So when I go down, I don't go. But here I go deep. So it's a question of our weight more than anything else because the, it's the same articulation. Yes, but the, again, it's totally imaginative way. To me, this is... I could make it... I don't like that. See if you can become a woodwind player all of a sudden. But fully. say a flute. And then of course later on this is a clarinet. More clarinet like. So you have the strings and then the flute above that. See, but he does this often in his orchestration, so it's not something new. So be very interesting when you do legato in chords, at least one note must be legato connected, then the ear kind of picks it up as that all the four are connected. It's not true, there's some of the thumb thumbs you can't do. But if you don't make that as a... Then if you don't make that attempt, then it's, it's going to... Yeah, you should, you should, all right? Can you try it again? Can you, can you do that? Because that's something. How do you do that? That's a famous place. Everybody wants to know. This, this part here. You'll follow exactly the fingering there, but I, I think it, what you're doing is you go there and then you change. So you break the triplet because of your fingering. But if you don't have, if you play it musically, it should be that without the fingering problem. Would you agree? So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three, one, two, three, one. But what you're doing is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, 
two, three, one, two, three, one. So my, uh, my solution was to How did I do it? I know that I got my I know that I got my fifth finger there. Wait, wait, wait. Ah, here it is. And then I use my thumb to connect to this, this one. Can you try that once? Now oh, the five. Yeah. It will sound better. Much better than because, in actual fact, you're jumping in the middle of it. That is rhythmically and musically not not uh, the best idea. Do you, do you understand what I was talking about? Can we do it? Can we go? Can we go? really makes it into the second beat more and then the fourth. And he corrects himself by make the fourth beat to go on to the first. But I really feel that you should make an effort. That way it will make it more serious. Again, it's a symphony. It's a major symphony but written for the piano. Yeah, try it. There's, uh, there's something which about your playing that I want to influence you, because you know we spend an hour together and it's gone. But if I can put in your mind that you, the, some notes you play, not all everything, and you play very well, but some of the notes you play as if it was unimportant, like... And I can hear that. That means you're not dedicated to... And if this comes later on in the development section quite a lot, when we go... See, this part... Every note becomes gold and must be played out. Um, there is a, in my mind, there is a difference, and it's very, very easily understood. If, for instance, you and I, we would sing, and I sing to the chagrin of my students because all of them cringe when I, I sing because I probably sing out of tune, but I sing with emotion to get them to do things, right? But I, I'm not a singer. So when I sing something, I just sing. But you ask a singer to sing anything, even a note, suddenly they grow into a certain posture, they draw breath, they feel that the sound comes out here, and it becomes an actual procedure to make a sound. Now, this, this is so important to understand in our piano playing, because we never have to make that sort of a commitment to play a note. I just play the note. Do you follow what I'm saying? But if you really want to play that note, then I approach it differently, like a singer approaches singing. Do you follow what I'm trying to yes. say? And so, for instance, to me, that's more important than it, 
it, it, it, that's what I, I, I kind of feel Beethoven sounds. And that's, that's where I think uh, we should really aim towards. Uh, because if you listen to a lot of Beethoven's uh, recordings and things like that, eventually you get your own Beethoven sound. I'm influencing you in one direction, and then a year from now, somebody else will do, direct you differently. But we are after what you will say as Beethoven, but certainly I don't think is, is, is a Beethoven sound. I think that you have to revise that. Try it again. And by the way, that's the tempo. One, two, three, four, one. Those are the heavy. Those are the most uh, heaviest, or more, more than the, the fourth and fifth finger. I try to avoid it here. The double forte is writing something which is nearly impossible to do. Try it. but it really goes to a resolution much more than another passage. Yes? And before that, he, he did all of the... He was very excited and for a long period. Here is nothing more... It's a resolution more of the crescendo, what he wants. And here, he put a forte piano and I think the forte piano is in your left hand. Because that starts, that's the... Yes? If you accent this, it takes away the, the melody. So this... another influence that I can put or another idea I can put in your head, don't just play a chord. 
that, that chord can be turned in different ways. Bring this out more, maybe less and less. You see? Then it's not full. This is a brown sound. Brahms could afford that because he already had this piano. But Beethoven didn't, and he was orchestrating it more than anything else. And the flute. That's the flute. Yes? And then this is the clarinet or oboe. Yes? should be unified as we did in the, the very beginning otherwise you have measure by measure by measure it doesn't work it's too simple it seems to you thing going on here. He's teasing us to the, the, the left hand on me. He went back. Then he says, I'm going to start again. Then he goes on. That's how you get the crescendo, if you feel that. If you just feel to do the crescendo, there's no need to do it. Yes, there, there is a need to do it because he is structuring it. And he does the same thing in the next one. And he starts again. What an, what an amazing thing to do. Sorry. Yes. Th this. He's working towards that. So you have to have an aim. Why does he do this? The two, and then he goes somewhere else. Another two, and then he goes to there. And then it suddenly it becomes different. Yes? Try it again from there. Yeah. So, from there. Thank you. 
same. Play the flute, uh, maybe the oboe, flute, clarinet, and so. So you've got a mixture of sound going on. It's not just. It has a, it has a uh, intention of making it very not just jumping around. And one one other thing. Land there. It, this is a very good idea to land on the thumb. This feeling. Try it again. Make more music out of it. When, when you are by yourself, I think the problem is in the finger. To me, I I, I use the most unusual finger because. I use one three, one three, one one two three, one two three, one three two one, because I control that better. As soon as you play, as soon as you put your fourth and third finger together, it will not be even or, me, or melodic. I bring it to you. Everything is, is you're unified in the same fingering. Try it at home, not now. It's, it's, again, this is a private lesson type of thing. But you will not, it sounds, uh, it's not as flippant as that. It is much more than that. Try it. symphony, the Eroica symphony, and the first movement. And you will find that the development section has a huge, huge area uh, of double forte that the orchestra is played. Now, the orchestra has a much more of a chance of uh, uh, color changes than we do, but we can do it too. But the idea of this is that it is a struggle uh, of Beethoven, uh, and you, you lose tension by belittling it. It's a constant struggle, and I can I I know that what you need to do. It still needs that that uh, strength more than just suddenly soft. Um, okay, uh, let's let's try to do the uh, coda if we don't mind because of the lack of time. Um, go to the D flat. But at 
this moment, there are no more accents. It's all double quarter. <laughs> it's no longer. Uh, so he divides it that he wants the second and fourth beat to be more exciting, but at the moment he re then he has to resolve the excitement. That's classical philosophy. So this part. <laughs> Yes? Can you try it any way you like? I don't mind. and faster and that destroys the Beethoven's ironclad moment of tension the, this idea of that is not it's a really a fantastic moment of, of real tension getting the tension when you're playing this you have a tendency to play the first three notes you're losing me. And that's where you're heading towards. Because if, you, if you're emptying the right hand, it sounds like not, not, not as convincing as... And here's the second beat again, what we are we got used to. So can we go to the... From there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accent it. Yeah, but Beethoven writes something different. He is giving us a very difficult time here. That level is that note. Now the next note cannot be. The level of the, this note. Because it's a continuation. Whereas in the first time it was two measures. Here he wants four measures. way to deal with this this idea which is very very important the decay of the note is what we are listening for when when you got to this level here yes how it decays I have to pick it up here yes so I can cheat a little by saying that I will play a little bit more so that I'm safe this I know that I can do that here, and I can make that crescendo. I always feel that pianists are kind of magicians, because a great pianist somehow manages to do that, and um, with the limitation that we have on our piano, and yet it's possible by doing that sort of little thing. So don't go so deep into double piano at the very beginning.
this out. A lot of people sort of make the mistake. The first one is in absolute time. Yes, first two is the absolute time. And the next one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It's in time. Only the last one is ritardando. And they always end up crescendo. second beat. That's the second beat. If you go then that destroyed the second beat. The second beat is more important, obviously, because not only it's forzato, but to play this and then follow with this, you have to do it. But if you make that, then it doesn't work. Um, I think the most remarkable thing about it is that A flat. That's what the, that's what I love to hear, because that's the, you got actually it goes. That's chromatic scale, yes. Yeah. Um, do you realize that what he sets up is the same thing when he goes? Sorry. So he goes. It's the same ending, same harmonic ending as the sonata, uh, the first movement. Or for that matter. Yes. So you have the same harmony. He is obsessed with the chromatic harmony going down. And uh, unless we can hear it here. to understand what's going on. Try it once more, you know. Again, it's a, Beethoven is so uncanny, so precise what he wants. The first note is a yom, accent. But then he doesn't want accent. He wants double forte. And all of them the same. Imagine if you would be von Karajan conducting the Berlin Philharmonic. He wouldn't go pom, pom. He would go yum, pom, pom. Again, the Beethoven sound. Now you play loud, but I'm not too sure the loudness is an orchestral sound. This is to me not a, so think about this. You play Beethoven's symphony. That's, that's something. We are so lucky because we don't need an orchestra. It would be lovely to have one, but we don't need it. This is the great symphony. Okay? Thank you. And so we have... Wait till I get there, okay? I get there. Okay, thank you. I can sit here. Just the first one. Then we have to go to the others if you like.
Sure. Wonderful play. We are really blessed to have Beethoven think about the piano as his major instrument and write 32 incredible sonatas. And uh, towards the end of his life, of course he did not know it was towards the end of his life, but it really he had several more years after this, he produced three sonatas that are the, probably the top of the mountain. And, and uh, I wonder if you uh, sort of dwelled or you thought about these sonatas, because I think that playing one of them is okay, but one is just one. There should be three in your mind while you're playing one. Uh, uh, it's no, it's, of course, we learn one of them at a time, but still, uh, the, 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 the meaning of this sonata can only be more and more achieved if you know what the 109 is about and what 111 is about, or what we think it's about, because he didn't talk about these things. Uh, it's like Chopin, he, uh, they, they, they seem to feel that the music in, in itself is enough, you don't have to describe it. But there are certain questions uh, the 109, which is one of the most popular pieces at this festival, everybody nearly plays it, um, was dedicated to Maximiliano Bretano. Maximiliano Bretano. Do you know who this person was? Uh, well, you sh you, that's, this is one of the reasons why I think it's important. I think it's important to know the historical aspect of something. We are we meant to reproduce that in our own image, and you need all the help you can get, everything you can get, in order to do that. Well, Miss Britano was a beautiful young lady who took some lessons with Beethoven, but she was really a singer. Uh, of course, in the aristocracy, very rich people. And so that's why you have the aria of the third movement of 109, because she was a singer and it became obvious that he dedicated this to her. There's no dedication to this sonata. That baffled a lot of Beethoven scholars. Why? And the last one is, of course, to uh, Archie Rudolph, who was the banker who helped him survive with his uh, money. But it uh, doesn't mean that, uh, what, what does it mean? It's just, it, it is a debate among Beethoven knowledgeable people who, who, who take most of their life in, in, in dwelling into what, what happened to Beethoven and what did he eat on a Wednesday afternoon and all that sort of thing, which is, which is fine. I mean, you know, we don't have to go into that level. Uh, my favorite person, uh, it was the curator of the Liszt Museum in Budapest, who I got to know, and she absolutely knew when he went to the dentist. She knew absolutely when he changed his glasses and everything, meaning Liszt. I wouldn't think that's important for us as a performer, but it's nice to know. But I have read so many different possibilities of why not, why not, this amazing piece. somebody. I wish he would have dedicated to me or some, somebody, <laughs> you know. It's so beautiful. It's a shame it's not. And then a lot of people started to feel, well, this must have been the lady he was secretly in love with. Maybe. I'm not suggesting that I know by any means, but maybe. And then the person who is around this period is so close to him and his family is 
Miss Britano's mother, who was a gloriously beautiful lady. But of course, again, aristocracy, royalty, and everything would keep Beethoven terribly far away and, and, and at times, uh, well, of course, hesitant to even approach, even the thought of approaching such a lady it would have been a horrible thing for him. But nevertheless, uh, it gives me the liberty as a performer to think of this love. And if I think of this love, then I play it differently. I don't know if I can influence you into doing that. Because, I mean, when, when, you, when you get to this level... Ah, oh, it's just the, the whole optimism, or whole movement of, uh, of, of uh, radiating of optimism, that there is a possibility that I can show you my love is all there, and it depends on how you play it. I have a feeling, it, it's, it is a criticism, that's what I'm here for. It, it, you played it beautifully, but kind of a matter of fact, as if it was okay. But the most difficult part of this whole page, really, is the first four measures, which I really would like you to introduce you to the idea that this is really an introduction. You make a, such a big deal out of it that the introduction becomes nearly more important than the melody which follows. You see, this is a... By the way, there is no crescendo there. Here a little one. Somehow he transports us into heaven through the first four measures. I, what I felt when you were playing is too big. It, it takes away from, you cannot do after that a beautiful melody. It takes away. And I think that, uh, I really feel that all composers, while they play, they mean every note that they write, there is, there is a hierarchy of what is more important or what is less. There is a wonderful story of this that I can really support, and that was Rostropovich. When I was a student, he came to Indiana University, and that was a big deal, because for the first time he was coming to university. And he didn't, didn't play the cello, he played the piano. <laughs> and he gave a master class. And one of them was actually the Symphony of Concertante of Prokofiev, which is great for cello, of course. And it's supposedly, he was living at the apartment of fla above Prokofiev. And Prokofiev would intermittently use a broom and go boom, boom, boom for uh, Rostropovich to come down. And he would come down and he would play the, this Symphony of Concertante and of course I can't demonstrate it, but Rostropovich did. And he was saying, he was saying, the Prokofiev while he was playing, he was yelling, not yet, not yet. This is good, good, but not yet. And now he says, here it comes. And it, I remember that so much in everything I do that yes, everything is important, but there are mountains, there are moments that you grab you and has to be more, more. So don't destroy the more by playing more before. <laughs> Time. You, you can do better. Somehow it sounds empty, I'm sorry. Better. On a 
strict level, you have at least four different temples there, which is possible. It's your, your, your world, your, I'm not, but you see it's one, two, three, go one. Now this hairpin is a misunderstanding on your part. It is not really a crescendo in the same way as a crescendo is. It is movement, because he doesn't move here. He wants the same tempo, but here he wants to move. That's important because it's a chromatic scale. And then, you, if you play this, this is really, this is an ending to the trill. It's a written out entry. Well, you can decide what you do with it, but hairpins are misunderstood by uh, as a really the hairpins um, are more flow or ebb and flow of the music rather than crescendo. Yes, by doing a flow, that means you move the music, you make a crescendo, but. When you have a crescendo, you have a crescendo, but you don't have to make it faster. But here, you want to move the G, And again, how much you wait is it? To me, that, that's a hiatus. Do you ever sing while you before you play uh, something, sing. sing. You look at me like I was saying sin. <laughs> no, sing. <laughs> no, you don't like your voice? I don't often sing. <laughs> you should, you should. The best way to practice is for you, I will not demonstrate because as I mentioned before, my voice is terrible. But if I would be practicing this, I would sing it first listen to it before I play it. Because I have to formulate what I want in my head and not in my fingers. My fingers follow my hearing, my head. This is so important and so impossible to teach because the actual action of playing the piano is fascinating to students. For me too, I'm, I'm not saying I wasn't like that, but I've changed a long time ago. I, I feel it. I feel the, the, the this chromatic scale. That little hairpin is not a major. You you making it into the head. Of course, it's very difficult to do. Well, once more and then we go on. We can we could spend the whole afternoon on this, honestly. I have to stop you because that's not what's written. You, you play it. He doesn't want to finish there. And he wants a four measure phrase. And uh, I jokingly say this to, often to my students when they play small little things. Small, like one measure. That's how we talk to children. Have you ever thought of it? When I talk to my grandson, I say, Noah, do you want to go outside? Shall we play? No. Oh, no, read a book. Which book? I couldn't talk to you like that. Yes? These small little things, uh, maturity brings us sentences that we say. And it's our duty to find sentences in here. So when you play,
is the long sentence coming up. You will find it very satisfying when you can achieve that one line, and it's a statement. It is not five different things you wanted to do. Once more, and then I'll leave you alone. But if you go this way, that's finished. You don't want to finish. Wants to continue and then again. You have to watch that. So controlling the sound and the, it's up to us. To me, this is more like an eight measure phrase. It's not in small little thing. Unfortunately, you have a tendency, and I watched your body. I could hear that you are withdrawing there. For me, it's just I want to go on. I think that you will find it much more satisfying and for the audience too. First of all, it is uh, st yes staccato, but with a slur. So that is so Beethoven, so gloriously beautiful. Then the left hand, double bass. when he goes to the F, then he moves down. So it is very important that the F, where it says crescendo actually, is a different sound. It's still played by the double bass, but it is this, this wonderful. Yes, he changes color. Until then, it is one harmony practically, and then suddenly more and more, more and more harmony. 
take place. Now, a composer like Beethoven, when he has more uh, harmonies to do, uh, then he becomes more excited. And he, he really is getting more and more excited as, as he goes towards the next section, which of course is... <laughs> That's a lot of harmonies to do to to digest, yes? And so it all starts with that F in the bottom. Can you do it from there? May I suggest it's good. You you I love the, the, this part is very good. It's very, very good. Uh, sorry, it's in the I like that. But here is, we have to change the color. Less leggero and more close to it. And it changes, you have to change color there. Yes. I'm objecting, but I'm asking you to tell me the reason why you want to slow it down there. Do you think that... I think, uh, maybe I like extend a little bit right here um, into the finger and mm, not getting back a tune that is... Yeah, that's possible. Everything is possible, but be very careful because up here the sound dies. You have to have movement. The tempo you're taking it is, is, is a very difficult to, the momentum to carry the momentum. And don't forget, this is where it is. It's moderato cantabile, so it's not even andante. So it, uh, he is very precise in what he is trying to achieve. So he's not, uh, he, he doesn't want a slow movement. He, he really wants some movement there. But that is, is totally up to you, but be very careful of the rhythm. The crescendo, you, you're bringing me the crescendos of the second movement much more than this. This is only a little one to emphasize the beauty of more than that. It to 
and use those same fingering. Yeah, or two, yeah. see, you do. Read on, yes. It's uh, very important that the crescendo, whatever it is, so it's only in the last moment that you can write that. Yes, somehow, uh, it's okay, uh, somehow there's. That belongs to it. It's not a separator that you play this. Now we start. It's not, it's part of the procedure of the you're doing and yet I would not do it. I would let the music do it on its own. Somehow I feel that you'll be interfering while it's like telling everybody listen to this this is so beautiful. It, it does it on its own or most of the time. And I mean, it's not really Dolce, but you, you did beautifully. I like it. like what we talked about already in the Wallstein, he's getting a crescendo of intensity, much more than crescendoing. And I think that if you crescendo with the left hand, you really, it just will become too much. Uh, the idea of separated and not to make too much of a crescendo. It works because I the actual crescendo is the, is the, uh, the feeling of the same theme becoming more and more intense until he re resolves to it. You 
result to that, and we'll come to that in a second. to go and say, play me this. And the reason for that is that you have a tendency to play beautifully. So you, you're playing those two measures so as a separate entity. This is... It's continuation, but uh, it, uh, the... Uh, um, here you have a that's a little one. You see? Now just before you go on, this is very important because the first one that's a very important because then it goes to this. reminds you of B-flat minor. The second sonata of Chopin. But it's all darkness. And I think in order to make this, when, when you finally get to here, that's light. That is so glorious. You can feel the warmth of sunlight coming in to our, our being. But in order to do that, you have to have the opposite before to make the contrast. And he does it. He gives you B-flat minor, and out of B-flat minor, he actually goes from B-flat minor to the E-flat and the exam. But it's only momentary that he can do that. So, in a way, he, he does something which became a very important compositional method for Beethoven. Or, the, or for the last part of his life, he has an F minor and he finds a release in D flat. Like in the B, uh, he has B flat, D, D for David flat, is a release key, like in the, in the, in the coda. He's releasing all the tension there. And then from the B, B flat, he goes to the B flat. And that's that. That somehow, at that moment, you really need to go. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It releases itself. Try it again from the F minor. to this uh, the trill that's where it's heading 
So what you did was that you played it so softly that it lost itself. The, the contour has to lean towards that. And then, of course, the French horns in the left hand take over. Once again from the A flat. something extraordinary happened there. Why? Because not only he tells us there's a, but, but it was the sound of this becomes and it becomes sweeter uh, in the sound. But if you look at it carefully, the D flat changes it into C sharp. That you have to react to that. You, you must, otherwise, you know, So there's something extraordinary happening here, which is, well, Beethoven at this stage of his life, he didn't improvise as much, but this comes from his habit of improvising, of you know, where can I go that, that uh, would be a little bit of a surprise. You have to give me a little surprise then. <laughs> time he wants a crescendo. So uh, you have to explore this somehow you know, it's it's like you build in yourself a resistance to to not to, to that you are going against something as you play physically. Otherwise it will it will be too fast. It will, there, there should be a resistance. Now, how do you put a resistance? Is it, it, you put it in your arm. And that's why here, as amazingly put, he put a very different, definite double octaves, which is much more difficult than one note. Good.
because I learned it from somebody else, I won't mention who, but he's very famous. He showed me to use my thumb. I didn't want to say it before, but here definitely it's there too. It's very simple, you use your arm. You see, you're doing it like this. See what I'm doing here, just this. You're using your arm, and as in the thumb is only an extension of the arm. It works beautifully, the sound. I go, da, 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 da. you go into it, look. Yes. Yes, it's what a, it's a very healthy way of playing the piano. Yes? Because you're totally loose, you don't. No. that is repeated. It always goes, the first one, next one, so it, it all, it cannot be always the same. Yeah? You have to somehow change it. And also the change of the crescendo. It's not really the crescendo that matters, but how intensifying you are doing. How you intensify the sound. so easy to just move on but the, but in actual fact the audience the listener what a wonderful how that resolves there's a wonderful reasoning for what he does and and he doesn't choose which is 
more important, the harmony node, which is discord, or the node that I've resolved to. And so you have to wait it out. Let's go. an embellishment so it's and the melody is in the left hand there So he wants to draw attention to the idea of very little so that I f I'm immediately going to the second movement because if you make a huge retardando the second movement is a separate entity and that's a choice which you have to make uh, I kind of look at the whole sonata as a whole sonata and not just first movement second movement and uh, try it once you go on. everybody don't, don't forget tonight the buses the buses leave thank you the buses leave on time 6 30 and then we have wonderful concertos tonight so thank you for coming and tomorrow we are downtown for the for the master classes that's why there are two buses leaving around one o'clock